were left unprepared and without. These represent believers who have become, or will become, self-reliant. The whole of these ten virgins, these individual members, represents the condition of the church in these latter times. As some scholars have noted, the virgins here are the friends of the bride, who are arranged to rush forth to meet the bridegroom as soon as his approach is signaled. The church, in our aggregate and ideal unity, is the bride. The members of the church, as individually called, are guests. In their separation from the world and expectation of Lord, the Lord's coming, they are his virgins. But that the bride was not mentioned to me is just so curious. I had to wonder if there was somehow more to this passage that perhaps Jesus purposely omitted the bride from this text, as though this passage was a lock and the key lied somewhere else in the scriptures. A while back, I was doing a, uh, a study on this passage with one of my friends, and he referred me briefly, he just mentioned the story of King David when he was fleeing from his son Absalom. Uh, who was seeking to overthrow him. So I decided to look into that and to see if there was any connection. I felt impressed uh, to do that, at that uh, as I was preparing for this sermon. So I'd like to invite you now to go to 2 Samuel 15, verse 16 and 17. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and begin reading from verse 16. And King David went forth, and all his household after him. And the king left ten women, which were concubines, to keep the house. And the king went forth, and all the people after him, and tarried in a place that was far off. Let us jump ahead to 2 Samuel 16, verses 20 through 22. Then said Absalom to Ahithophel, Give counsel of what we should do. And Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Go into your father's concubines, which he has left to keep the house, and all Israel shall hear that you are hated of your father. Then shall the hands of all that are with you be strong. So they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house, and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel. And finally, uh, let us go ahead and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 3. Just quickly moving through this story to kind of see what was going on. And David returned to his house at Jerusalem. And the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in a room, and fed them, but went not into them. So they were shut up unto the day of their death, living in Rome. In Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White gives further context to these passages. I'm just going to summarize what she said. So uh, we know that David is fleeing from Jerusalem because Absalom, his son, is pursuing him to overthrow him. Uh, Absalom's army is able to take Jerusalem or take Israel without much of a fight. So. At that point in time, a little bit later, Absalom comes to be surrounded by David's army. And Ahithophel, who is Absalom's chief counselor, knows that David is a mighty king. He knows that he is experienced generals and that his cause is not hopeless. And he realizes that if, for whatever reason, Absalom's rebellion should fail, he would be the one to take the most blame since he's the chief counselor. So, he said, well, I'm not going to go out like that. I'm going to be making sure that I'm not going to die. So, he prevents Absalom from retracing his steps by counseling him to do something in the eyes of the whole nation that would make reconciliation impossible. 
he urges Absalom to commit the crime of incest as, and add that to the crime of rebellion, which he had already begun. So, in the sight of all Israel, on the top of the house, he took advantage of these ten concubines. Once the war uh, is over, and Absalom is dead, uh, King David's army gaining the victory, uh, messengers came unto him. And uh, they said to him, you know, God is good. You know, your son Absalom rose up against you, but today the Lord has avenged you. But the only thing that David could think about in that moment was, is my son Absalom safe? Because he was supposed to be spared. Is my son Absalom safe? The messenger said to him, Lord, the enemies of your Lord, all that rose up against you to do your hurt, be it as that young man is, that was it, David knew. So he started walking up toward the chamber over the gate and crying. He said, my son, Absalom, my son, would God I would have died for you. Oh, my son, Absalom, my son. You may wonder why I've mentioned these various passages from Matthew and then this story, but I do believe there are links between the story of David and the ten concubines and the parable of the ten virgins. I'm going to go start naming some of those now. As many scholars have noted before, King David is a type of Christ figure. He charges his ten concubines with keeping his house, his kingdom, while he is away. While this event actually did occur, it is also prophetic for how Christ will go on to charge his church to keep his kingdom after he ascended from the earth to heaven. King David anticipated a siege coming from his rebellious son, Absalom. Christ anticipated a siege coming from his once highest ranked, now rebellious son, Lucifer. While David was away from his kingdom, he tarried for a while in a place far off. While Christ has been away from his kingdom, which is entrusted to his church, who early on earnestly anticipated his return, just as all ten virgins did initially anticipate the coming of the bridegroom, he tarried for a while in heaven, and still does. Absalom easily takes David's kingdom captive, and in order to claim the kingdom as his own, he takes advantage of David's ten concubines in the sight of all Israel. While Christ is away, Satan assails Christ's followers with temptation, ushers in confusion, brings them to a state of weariness, and flowers us with self-righteousness. Eventually, all ten virgins fall asleep while waiting for their bridegroom's return. And upon stirring from their slumber, five of the professed virgins realize they have committed adultery with the world, no longer possessing the saving all they once had so dear. They have become self-reliant. Eventually, Absalom's life is taken in battle. But despite Absalom's persistent, rebellious, and unforgiving nature, David loved him to the very end. He wept over him. He wished to God that he could have given his own life for his heartless son. And so, even Christ loves Lucifer this way to this day. Ellen White refers to this in great controversy, that Jesus sought to forgive him on many occasions when Lucifer began carrying out his wicked plans. At one point, Lucifer came to Christ, asking that he could be let back into heaven. And Christ wept and told him he could not be, because Lucifer was not apologetic for his actions, rather only sorrowful that he had a loss. He had lost his esteemed ranking. Lucifer had become self-reliant, but still desperately longed for a place in the universe. Oh, how he missed the very thing he longed for was standing right in front of him. Absalom betrayed David, as did Lucifer betray Christ, and, become, and became Saint, the adversary. If Christ can so have a heart for Satan after his rebellion, how much might he have it for us? Amen. The great tragedy of Satan, 
Absalom, the four, five foolish virgins, and everyone that rejects God is that they reject the very thing they belong for, and then go chasing after it someplace else. I'll go ahead and repeat that. The great tragedy of Satan, Absalom, the five foolish virgins, and everyone that rejects God is that they reject the very thing they long for and then go chasing after it someplace else. Satan's whole dominion is built upon that belief, the belief that there is another way. Make no mistake, so is ours in this world. The Laodicean church, which while we do not, do not have time to explore today, is personified in the parable of ten virgins as all ten virgins, not just the foolish, because they all slumbered. But the Laodicean church most poignantly rep represents the five foolish virgins. But the term Laodicea translated from the Greek language actually means a self-reliant. As the Lord said to the five foolish virgins who came to the marriage door after it was shut, He will also say to any who choose self-reliance, I do not know you. He will not coldly say it, as though he has erased them from his memory. Rather, he is saying, we never joined me in the marriage procession. We never became one. I do not know you. Otherwise, he is saying they have rejected the simple, eternal invitation to be known. The words which gently reverberate from the heartbeat of the universe to every arm of its reach, to each and every bit of space and matter in existence. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. To be known is to be his bride. And to be his bride is to be both a wise virgin with oil, resting in the faith of Jesus and obeying his commandments, and to make the cry at midnight. Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go out to meet him. Why is the bride absent from the parable of ten virgins? Perhaps Jesus has invited us to fill in the blank. Perhaps he has given us both the lock and the key to say she is there. She is the reason the wedding is happening because she has finally become who she was meant to be. The light of the world as Christ is the light of the world. He waits upon us, his bride, to ready herself. And when she does, how the bridegroom will lovingly rush to meet her. The procession of the bridegroom is synonymous with the procession of the bride. Come to me, all you who try your own way and are self-reliant, and you will be known forever. It is the simplest call, but it requires the most reckless abandonment. Will you be known and be God's, or will you be self-reliant and miss the very thing you wait for? Amen. This time we'll be singing our closing hymn, which is Trust and Obey, number 590.
opportunity to trust and obey, whether we might do it for the first time, first time in a while, or we're continuing on the path, Lord, lead us after you, God. We have questions, if we are skeptical about things, might we ask, might we search you out, might we ask somebody else about it. The devil wants to get us into our cubby holes of fear, and then to cause us to be comfortable then and say, well, I think I have decided what I think about this without searching out all the questions we might have inside us. God, lead us recklessly then to the beautiful love that your church, this church, might begin its procession. You will come to me as Lord. This we trust. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.